Hey, Lamont Wilson, and he's got some really great work in store for you. And, and then after that, Nisia the Lovely, followed by Anne Marie Davis. It's just gonna get better and better and better. Um, so we don't take a break, because we got too much, and we want to do want to get to our open mic. So if you haven't had a chance to put your name on the open mic um, form on the table over there, please feel free to do so, so that we will have time, hopefully we'll have time for you to be able to share as well. I'm on that. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Wander. It's a great honor to be here. I first uh, performed at uh, the celebration back in uh, 2013, uh, sharing the poems of my ancestors, uh, both of my parents who were, who were poets. And I began in the years to follow to share my own uh, work, uh, poems, uh, story, uh, and song. So the, the poem I'm going to share with you today is inspired by the first line of the poem, Dedication for a Plot of Ground by the poet William Carlos Williams, who wrote about his grandmother's immigrant experience in the West Indies. I wrote about my mother's migrant experience in West Oakland. This plot, this plot of ground at the corner of 7th and Brush Streets in West Oakland welcomed Jesse Lee Dawson, whose family of Texas sharecroppers migrated to work in Oakland's shipyards during World War II. This plot of ground provided the first home for that little black girl outside of the Jim Crow South, a one-bedroom apartment where her family also slept in the kitchen and the hall, and Jesse Lee and her sister slept in the closet. This plot of ground offered this little girl a closet window so high, she stood on her bed to look out at the sailors, shipyard workers, and nightclubbers who walked up and down 7th Street to visit the bars, blues clubs, and jazz joints. This plot of ground bid farewell to this girl and her family who moved to the segregated Harbor Homes housing project next to Moore's shipyard before returning to Texas after the war when shipbuilding slowed. This plot of ground witnessed the building bulldozing of its buildings, including the girl's first apartment in the state to make way for I-980 leaving nothing but tree saplings and ivy seedlings behind the freeway's chain link fence. This plot of ground watched the son of this girl, now grown, visit to try to surprise her for Christmas with a photo of her first California home, only to find there is no there there. So he photographed the green and white street signs at the corner of 7th and Brush and gave her that. This plot of ground observed the son of this woman, now dead, make pilgrimages to it, to walk in his mother's footsteps around the block, to peer through the chain link fence at the homeless encampment amid the trees and ivy where his mother's apartment once stood. And when he passes, on his way to San Francisco for his poetry readings, he waves for her blessings. Thank you. Uh, last month, uh, my poem, uh, This Plot, was selected as a finalist in the Alexandria Quarterly First Line Poetry Contest and will be published this year. Thank you. For the next piece I'm going to do, I'm going to, I need my hands, so I'm going to do it without the mic in my hands. <coughs> so let's begin. I bought a new umbrella, a replica of the umbrella 
seen in the 1982 sci-fi film Blade Runner, depicting Los Angeles in the year 2019. <coughs> I press the button in the handle, and the umbrella lights up like a lightsaber. I wish I could open it all the way to show you my umbrella in its full glowing glory, but it's bad luck to open an umbrella inside. I bought it on Amazon uh, to light my path when I jogged before dawn, but I have yet used it to protect my head from rain at night. One Saturday night, I had to go to San Francisco to see a play by my friend Baruch. When I opened my porch door, rain hit my porch. Yes, I get to use my Blade Runner umbrella at night for the first time. <laughs> I grabbed it, drove to the Del Norte BART station, and caught a train to the city. By the time the play ended, the rain had stopped. I turned on the flashlight in the handle of my Blade Runner umbrella. It lit my path as I walked the wet streets of the Mission District to the 16th Street BART station. I boarded an eastbound train. Engrossed in the book I was reading, I forgot no direct trains run to Richmond on Saturday night. When I raised my head from my book, I arrived at Fruitvale Station. <laughs> Waiting on the elevated platform for my transfer train, I felt a chill. Wasn't Fruitvale the station where Bart police shot and killed an armed man, unarmed black man, Oscar Grant, some years ago? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Where did they throw him on the platform and shoot him in the back? Am I standing in the exact spot? I gotta get out of here. This station is haunted. I boarded a San Francisco train. <laughs> Two white BART police officers boarded the car after me. One stood at the door across from where I sat. The other stood at the door at the end of the car. I thought nothing of them at the time. Uh, perhaps they were looking for someone. But I found it odd they did not patrol from car to car. They just stood there. I continued reading. I got off at Lake Merritt and waited there where I felt safer for the Richmond train. It arrived 10 minutes later. I boarded. And the same two BART police officers boarded my car again. They were following me. I, I made a connection between BART police and the chill I felt at Fruit Belt. My umbrella. It does not collapse into a compact it comes with a long bag. You slip over it. And carry it on your back. But when I walk through Bart, I carried my umbrella like this. <laughs> I realized BART police thought I was a potential mass shooter. I could not run away from them. I could not argue, hey, this is an umbrella. I did the only things I knew how to do. I left my umbrella alone on the seat beside me, and I read. At the next station, a third BART police officer entered the car and joined the other at the end of the car. 
like SEAL Team 6. The three spoke not a word. They communicated with their eyes. Everyone knew their position. Everyone knew their task. Guns at the side. They blocked the exits around me. They pretended not to watch me, but I knew they were watching me. Glancing up from my book, I wondered about those gizmos on their bulletproof vests. Body cams! No wonder why they stand so still. Four cameras also filmed from the bark car ceiling, and more cameras filmed in each station. I was under surveillance the moment I entered BART with my umbrella. I then did something I probably should not have done. I didn't think anything of it at the time because I did this all the time when I read on BART. In front of police, I reached for my belt and pulled out my Swiss Army knife. I opened a three-inch pair of scissors, cut a strip from a large post-it note, scribbled a notation and page number, and affixed it to the page I read. Bookmark. The officer across from me watched with interest, but did not draw his gun. Finally, he nodded to the officers at the end of the car and vanished into the crowds uh, at Berkeley. The two remaining officers stood with bored looks on their faces as if they had uh, imagined their surveillance of me would end with gunfire and an arrest. By the time I arrived at uh, Del Norte, no BART police officer surrounded me. In the days and weeks to come, I watched over and over again the passenger cell phone videos of the BART police shooting of Oscar Grant in 2009. I imagine how my death would appear <coughs> if camera phones and body cams had filmed me from different angles if BART police had shot me in 2019. I imagine myself becoming the second ghost to haunt Rootville Station. Thank you very much. Peace and love, everyone.